सब्सक्राइब टू आर चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन टू नेवर मिस एनी अपडेट फ्रॉम राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल ज्वाइन द ओनली ऑफिशियल टेलीग्राम चैनल ऑफ राउज आई एस स्टडी सर्कल टू गेट द रेलिवेंट मटीरियल्स एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट अपडेट्स हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड द वर्ट वाई एंड हाउ ऑफ द न्यूज पेपर नार्सिस फ्रॉम सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन परस्पेक्टिव सो टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द हिंदू डेली एडिशन डेटेड टेंथ जुलाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू and for important topics from the indian express explain section of the last week the topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and a time stamping of the same has been provided in the description box below this topic is in relation to the critical minerals this topic has appeared in indian express explain section in the context of the recent agreement between india and australia for the trade of critical minerals As far as the UPSC syllabus is concerned, this topic falls under General Studies Mains Paper One in the subsection of Geography because it mentions distribution of key natural resources across the world. As we have already discussed, that the context of this very news article is the Indian-Australian deal, which is known as the Critical Minerals Investment Partnership. Now, in this very relation, you should be aware about two things. First, about the critical minerals. and in this very relation one another term comes up which is known as the rare earth minerals now what is the difference between the critical minerals and the rare earth minerals in this session we are going to deal with their basic definitions their utility their global distribution the chinese context in this very domain as well as the challenges which india face so now let us begin our detailed discussion first of all we should understand that what is exactly meant by the critical minerals and the rare earth minerals now on one hand rare earth minerals is decided by the chemical composition of the minerals in the periodic table which we used to learn about it in class 7th or class 9th and 10th in this very periodic table there is one lanthanide series which consists of 15 elements now all these 15 elements that belong to the lanthanide series plus in addition to this two more elements that is the scandium as well as yttrium these 15 plus these two total 17 elements are known as rare earth minerals now why do these are called as rare earth minerals are they found in rare quantities in the earth crust no absolutely not they are found in abundant quantity in the earth crust but despite this fact they are known as rare so what makes them rare the rarity is not in the form of availability or the quantity of these minerals but the ability to extract them these minerals are not found in the pure form these minerals are always found in association with several other minerals in a complete ore let's say there are several minerals which are there in ore and in this very ore there will be one rare earth mineral so it becomes very difficult to extract this rare earth mineral from this complete ore as far as the present technological advancements are concerned it becomes very expensive to extract these minerals and that is why these are known as the rare earth minerals on the other hand the critical minerals has not to do anything with the composition these minerals can be metallic as well as non metallic but there are only two criteria to address any mineral as a critical mineral first these minerals are highly relevant in modern day technologies for example manufacturing of mobile phones using in the defense equipments space crafts etc so these minerals are critically important in the field of modern technology and second there is a huge risk in their supply chain as we have witnessed during the covid pandemic these minerals faced a huge challenge in terms of their supply chain now why there is a risk in their supply chain because of three primary reasons one is lack of availability because many of these critical minerals and as we have discussed that these minerals are very difficult to be extracted from these ores and hence their availability in this context is very rare second because the modern technologies its utility modern industries are growing that is why there is a huge demand of these minerals and that huge demand cannot be met simultaneously across all the regions and the third important thing is that to process these minerals is very difficult it requires a huge amount of capital 
technology as well as skilled labor to process these minerals. And because of these two reasons, that is their utility in the modern technology and their risky business in their supply chain make these minerals critical. Now the utility of critical minerals as well as the rare earth minerals is in multi-dimensional areas. For example, they are used in health, they are used to make several equipments which detect cancer, they are used in arthritis. Second, they are used to build electronic equipments, for example, phones as well as computers. Then these minerals are also used in batteries, in electric vehicles. Moreover, they are further used in renewable energy sources, for example, manufacturing of solar panel. And in the ultra high tech space, for example, defense sector as well as space sector, these minerals are used. Have you heard about lithium, cobalt, etc.? These are also the critical minerals for several countries. Now here is a catch. On one hand, rare earth minerals are defined exactly that these 15 minerals which are in lanthanide series plus scandium and yttrium are known as rare earth minerals. But the critical minerals will be different for different countries. There is a reason for it. Because in some countries, the availability of these minerals might be large they might be having sustainable supply chains so in that sense those minerals will not be critical for that very country for example let's say china has abundant sources of lithium so it might be the case that lithium is not a critical mineral for china but on the other hand because india is deficient in lithium so lithium becomes a critical mineral for india so in this very sense going by the upsc syllabus we should know the distribution of critical minerals as well as the rare earth minerals across the world. Now here are two maps. This shows the distribution of the critical minerals across the world. And as you can see, the most of the region lies in the US and Canada. Then we have Australia and then we have Southeast Asia as well as some parts of China. Further, the critical minerals are also there in Japan. Similarly, when it comes to the distribution of the rare earth minerals, this map shows its global distribution. Again, we can see that there is a huge overlapping of these areas as per this map. For example, a huge amount of rare earth minerals are found in United States and Canada, then in Australia, then in some parts of China as well as Southeast Asia and also some parts of Africa. Here also we had presence of critical minerals in Africa. An important thing to be note here is that there are certain rare earth minerals present in India also. But in the present times, the major challenge which India as well as other countries like US, Australia, Canada, etc. are facing is the Chinese rising dominance in this particular sector. The Chinese threat in the areas of rare earth elements as well as critical minerals. So in this very sense, this map shows the major Chinese mining acquisitions in the period of 2019 to 2021. Chinese are aggressively acquiring the mining areas in different continents in different areas because they know that these minerals are going to the future of the manufacturing industries. For example, China has acquired certain mines in Canada, Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, Congo, and if you can see, there are different minerals for which these mines are famous. For example, cesium, lithium, platinum, cobalt, etc. So this is how the China is thinking and they are acquiring the important mines across the world. Now, according to the 2019 USGS Mineral Commodity Summaries Report, China is the world's largest producer of 16 critical minerals. Now this shows the Chinese dominance. According to the report of International Energy Agency, China is responsible for some 60 to 70 percent of the global production of cobalt and rare earth elements. Further, the level of concentration for certain other minerals, for example, lithium is up to the tune of 90 percent with China. But an important thing which is to be considered here is that in terms of available quantity of these minerals, 
China is not very dominant, but when it comes to their production, their processing, their selling, China is the leading country. As we have seen here, that major mines across the world have been acquired by China. And as far as the data are concerned, China consumes around 67% of the total consumption of these rare earth minerals worldwide. Further, after China, the dominant countries in consumption are Japan, US and European Union. The data further suggests that China controls about 90% of the global production of the rare earth metal while it possesses only 36% of the global reserves of this rare metal. Now till now we have talked about the global distribution of these critical elements as well as the China's dominance. Now we must also understand that where does India lie in all this game. Now here first we must understand that India has fifth largest reservoir of the rare earth minerals. And in 1950s, we recognized the importance of these rare earth metals and hence we started a dedicated public sector undertaking to extract and to process these rare earth elements. But in present times, we are lagging behind several countries. This is because of the associated challenges. The first challenge was that Yes, in 1950s, we started a focus towards these rare earth minerals, but we could not catch up with it. In subsequent years, there was a lack of dedicated policy as far as the rare elements as well as the critical elements were concerned. Similarly, India focused on downstream linkages in a very efficient manner, but we somehow could not focus on the upstream linkages. There is a huge supply chain crisis when it comes to the upstream linkages. That is, we are not able to ensure the supply of the raw materials in India. The third challenge came in the form of environmental risk because these minerals are to be mined and given the geological sensitivity of India, there are huge environmental risks associated with these areas. Next comes the level of technology which is required for mining these elements. There is a high level of technology which is required for it. And as we all know that India's research and development program is very minuscule when compared to the countries like China and USA. Hence, we can imagine the research and development which was put in this specific area. Next challenge comes that India still is not able to develop entrepreneurship in this particular sector and because of this result the foreign investors are not coming to India. There is another reason for the lack of foreign investors attraction towards India is that many of these elements or their mining is reserved for the public sector. So because of this reserved status several private foreign players feel hindered in coming to the India's rare earth and critical element markets. So that is why in this section what we have learned till now, we are going to revise it. Initially we talked that what exactly are the rare earth minerals. Then we come to know that rare earth minerals are those elements which are belong to the lanthanoid series in the periodic table and scandium and yttrium in addition to it. On the other hand, we also come across the basics of the critical minerals which has nothing to do with the chemical composition. There are just two parameters that is their high utility in the modern technologies as well as high risks in their supply chains. These two components make any mineral as critical. Then we looked at the utility in various sectors of these minerals. After that we looked at the global distribution of these elements across the world and we saw that the dominant countries and regions in this specific area is North America, Africa, Australia as well as China. Then we also looked that how aggressively China is acquiring the mines across several regions in order to control the supply of these minerals. And in the last, we came down to the perspective of India and we saw that despite the fact that India started its rare earth program in 1950s, still we are not able to pick up that program in the true manner. And there are several challenges which are hindering India in order to become a dominant player in this particular sector. In this topic, we are going to learn about Katsa. Now, what does this Katsa stand for? 
and why this agreement is recently in news. This topic has appeared in Indian Express Explain section and is in relation to the recent demand which has been made by the congressmen in order to give a waiver for India from the federal law that is CARTSA. We will understand that what exactly is CARTSA and how India is related with it. But first of all, we should understand that where does this topic lies. This topic falls under the General Studies Mains Paper 2 section in the International Relations and the subsection because it mentions bilateral, regional and global groupings and agreements involving India or affecting the Indian interests. In this very line, we will understand that what are the basics of CARTSA and what can be its implications on various countries. And I will leave it to your wisdom to think about that whether this CARTSA in today's geopolitical perspective is relevant. Is it a practical approach by US to preserve its own national interests or not? Now, first of all, what exactly is CARTSA? It stands for Countering the America's Adversaries through the Sanctions Act. Now, as the name is signifying, the basic objective of CARTSA is to punish those countries which are involved in agreements with the America's adversary countries. Now, we all know that there are three dominant adversary countries of US. One is Russia, second is North Korea and third is Iran. Yes, we also know the China angle in this, but still the China is not the explicit adversary because in this very act, US has mentioned the list of these three countries alone because we all know that China in today's geopolitical perspective is rising and a dominant economic as well as military power and US has a significant proportion of trade with China as well. So that is why in the international relations, the China still is not the explicit adversary of the US. Yes, there is a competition between China and US in different regions. That is a different thing. But as far as the adversaries are concerned, China is out of this very list. Now, this law says that if any countries are having deep engagements or significant transactions with any of these three countries, they may face certain punitive actions, which might be in the form of certain sanctions. Now, these sanctions can be in the form of economic san sanctions or it can be related to the workforce. For example, the ease of the India's workforce, which can enter into the domestic territories of US, that is the regime related to the visa as well as the issuing of the passports. So all these are different types of sanctions. But there is an important catch here. It says deep engagements and significant transactions. Now, how can one define that whether such engagement is deep or not? How to define that whether the transactions are significant or not? Is there any quantifiable parameter that yes, let's say beyond 100 crores of sanction will be considered a significant transaction or this amount will be 200 crores or 1000 crores. So that is purely left to the subjectivity of the US administration. And that is why this provides the room for the US to preserve its national interest. Now, as far as India is concerned, we all know that India has entered into deal with Russia to purchase its S-400 missile defense systems. Now, this was the major element through which the debate around this caste has arisen because the Congress, because the US congressman is saying to provide a waiver to US. And as we all know that even during the nuclear agreement, India was providing a waiver way back in 2008. Similarly, there has been talks to provide the waiver in the Katsa regime also. Now, why India is typically provided the waiver that is purely the grounds of the diplomacy, the strength which Indian diplomacy commands in the international politics. We have good relations with all the countries. We are an emerging economic and military power. Moreover, if we see the geopolitics in today's especially Indo-Pacific region, the US needs India in that particular region to counter the growing China. So that is why we command because significant merits and hence time to time we are provided certain waivers. Now here we should also discuss the implications of CARSA and other countries which are involved in this. For example, China. 
Now, China is among the biggest purchasers of the Russian arms and partners in the major energy projects. For example, the power of Siberia gas pipeline. Similarly, we have Indonesia. So now there was a pressure from US on Indonesia as well, but somehow it defied the pressure and entered into the $1.1 billion deal with Russia for the Sukhoi aircrafts. Now comes Turkey. We all know that Turkey is an important NATO member and, and the NATO grouping revolves around the nucleus that is USA. Despite this fact, Turkey invited certain sanctions from US because it also entered into the agreement to purchase S-400 air defense systems from Russia. Similarly, the European Union, which is by far the most trusted partner of US countries like France, have also criticized this Katsa agreement on the ground that it infringes into the sovereignty of different countries, their freedom to protect their own national interests, and moreover, because we know that the countries like France are also involved in Russia's Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. So if we see that most of the major countries across the globe, for example, India, China, Indonesia, Turkey, European Union, Vietnam, almost all the countries from all the regions are somehow engaged with Russia either in the defense deals or in the energy deals. So do you really think that Katsa like approaches are practical in today's changing geopolitical perspective? So the answer remains to your own wisdom. However, in this session we have learned what exactly is Katsa, why it was started and which are those countries which are under the boundaries of Katsa and why there has been a talk to provide the waiver to India. This topic is in relation to the election of the Vice President of India and deals with the constitutional provisions which are directed towards the election procedure, eligibility criteria and the removal of the Vice President. This topic has again appeared in Indian Express Explained section and the latest context of this very news article is that the sitting Vice President of India, Mr. Venkaya Naidu's term of the office is going to end on August 10. And in this very regard, the elections for the next vice president has to be conducted. And therefore, the Election Commission of India has issued the notification for the same. So from the civil service examinations perspective, this topic becomes mainly relevant from the prelims perspective because here we are going to deal with the important constitutional provisions that is the factual details which govern the election system of the vice president. So in our Indian constitution, article 63 lays down that there shall be the vice president of India. That means the constitutional validity of the office of vice president comes from the article number 63. Continuation, the article 64 tells about that the vice president shall be the ex officio chairman of the council of states. This council of states is the Rajya Sabha. Now here it is to be understood that as far as the Lok Sabha is concerned, the Speaker of the Lok Sabha is elected by the members of the House, whereas the Chairman of the Rajya Sabha, that is Council of States, is the Vice President by virtue of being the Vice President. Then comes the Article 65. Now, Article 65 gives the power to the Vice President to become the President or to act as a President under certain conditions. And by this logic, in the terms of precedence, the office of the vice president comes at the second position in the order of hierarchy in India. Obviously, the first rank goes to the office of the president. The article 65 says that there might be some situation whereby the sitting president of India's office might be vacant. And this vacancy might be because of his death, his designation or his removal. In those circumstances, the Vice President of India shall act as the President until the date when new President is elected and he enters upon his office. Article 66 says that the Vice President shall be elected by the members of an electoral college consisting of the members of both the houses. Now this is very important. Despite the fact that the Vice President shall be the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha only, but because he is also the president of India and that is why his election 
takes the votes of the members of both the houses in accordance with the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote now proportional representation by the means of single transferable vote means that every voter will give the order of preference to the various candidates who are standing for the post of the vice president that means there might be some candidate for example a so the voter can give the first preference to the a then for the b he can give the second preference then for the c he can give the third preference and all this voting shall be done by the secret ballot now this is again important and it has been given in the constitution itself further the constitution also says that once the person who has been elected for the post of vice president he shall not be the member of either house of parliament or the house of legislature of any state and if the sitting member of such house is elected as the vice president then he shall vacate his seat in that particular house on the date on which he enters upon his office as the vice president so these are the important constitution articles which deal with the appointment and the election of the vice president next comes the eligibility criteria and the term of office of vice president article 66 clause 3 says that there are three eligibility criteria if someone does not fulfill these criteria he will not be eligible to stand for the election of vice president these criteria are that the person must be the citizen of india second he must have completed the 35 years of age and third he must be qualified to be elected as a member of the council of states that is the rajya sabha in this very line in next clause that is clause 4 it says that the person who is going to be elected as a vice president shall not hold any office of profit under either the union government or the government of any state article 67 provides for the term of the office and it says that vice president shall hold the office for the term of 5 years but again it is a qualifying statement in the sense that yes there is a 5 year limit on the term of the office of vice president but it might happen that the election for the next vice president might not take place before the expiration of this term of the sitting vice president in that very sense until and unless the new vice president is elected the sitting vice president will continue to hold the office it might be beyond the term of 5 years as well for example 5 years and 2 months that is why article 67 says that vice president shall hold the office for a term of 5 years however the vice president shall notwithstanding the expiration of his term that is even if his term has expired will continue to hold the office until his successor that is the new vice president enters upon his office which means that the position of the vice president cannot be vacant at any point of time further if he wants to leave the office before the expiration of his term that is 5 years he may do so by resigning to the president of india or he might also be removed by the resolution of the rajya sabha that is the council of states passed by the majority of all the then members of the council and agreed to by the house of lok sabha that is the house of the people and article 71 finally says that if there is any dispute regarding the election of vice president all those disputes shall be inquired into and decided by the supreme court this is very important because students might confuse it with the election commission election commission is the body which is responsible for conducting the elections but if there are certain doubts or disputes in this then the supreme court is the body who will inquire into it and the decisions of the supreme court shall be final this is provided by article 71 in our constitution so these are some of the important articles which deal with the election and the removal of the vice president of india and this is very important as far as the prelims examination is concerned this topic has appeared in today's the hindu delhi edition at page number 9 and the topic reads the glaciers in the dras sector are receding fast now the glacial melting in nowadays has become a very prominent feature 
in the backdrop of climate change and its multidimensional impacts on the downstream areas. The rising importance of this particular context has also been witnessed in the previous year questions asked in UPSC mains. For example, in UPSC 2020, the question was asked, how will the melting of the Himalayan glaciers have a far-reaching impact on the water resources of India? Similarly, in UPSC 2014, the question was asked in this fashion. You were asked to bring out the relationship between the shrinking Himalayan glaciers and the symptoms of the climate change in the Indian subcontinent. Now, this topic is mainly relevant from the General Studies Paper 1 point of view in the Geography section because it specifically mentions changes in the critical geographical features including the water bodies as well as ice caps and the effects of such changes. So in today's session we are going to discuss the causes of this glacial melting as well as the multifarious impacts of this melting. As we all know that the major cause of the glacial melting has been the anthropogenic activities which are the human activities. Since the period of industrial revolution, the humans have been extracting a lot of resources and expanding a lot of industries. This industrialization is further built on the strong networks of transportation. Now all these three activities that is the mining, industrialization and transportation demand land use changes, they emit greenhouse gases as well as they increase the average global temperature. Now because all these three components, the phenomena of global warming is arising and this increase in the global average temperature is the main cause behind the melting of the glaciers. The second important thing is the rise in the black carbon content. Now this black carbon is specifically dangerous because of its capacity to absorb greater sunlight. And this higher absorption of sunlight in turn results in the melting of the glaciers. Further, as we all know that oceans are one of the greatest carbon sinks. And because of this very fact, the heat entrapment in the oceans is also increasing. Because of which the marine glaciers are melting. And the last cause is the natural solar cycles. We all know that periodically there are increase or decrease in the intensity of the solar radiations. So in those periods whereby the solar radiation increases, naturally the glaciers available on the planet earth will melt. So these are the broad causes of the glacial melting. Now comes the impact of this melting. The first and the immediate effect of this melting is the rise in the sea levels. Because Whenever the glacial melts, the melted water is transported to the rivers and that water from rivers is finally dumped into the oceans, which in turn is leading to gradual increase in the sea levels across the world. Second, because there has been a rise in the sea level, which means that the available moisture content in the oceans increases, which in turn energizes the tropical cyclones. So it has been witnessed that because of the glacial melting, the frequency as well as the intensity of the coastal storms like tropical cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, etc. have drastically increased. Further, because of the entry of the fresh water into the oceans, the thermal conditions of the oceans have been varying. And because of the variation in the temperature of the oceans, there is a consequent variation in density as well as salinity. And the disturbance in temperature, salinity and density in turn affects the ocean circulations. For example, the thermohaline circulations. Next, because of the melting, the disasters like landslides, avalanches, glacial lake burstings as well as the floods increase. And not only the physical phenomena, it also have a huge impact on the human related needs. For example, the food and the water availability is drastically altered on account of the glacial melting. Further, it also has its impact on the wildlife and biodiversity. There are several species which can only be found in the temperate or the polar climatic conditions. For example, we have snow leopards. So once the glacial melting starts, the natural habitat of such species is disturbed and that is why 
there is a huge loss of wildlife and biodiversity in such areas. Now for the upcoming May 2022, in the papers of geography or the papers of environment, this topic is very important and hence you should be aware about the various causes of glacial melting as well as the impact of this melting. This is the final topic which is in relation to the recently excavated site which has its origin in the Buddhist literature. This is a Buddhist site being excavated in the state of Karnataka. In this very relation, we will look at certain key facts related to this very site will be relevant from the UPSC preliminary examinations perspective. So the name of the site is the Kanagana Halli which is located in the state of Karnataka on the banks of the Bhima river. Now this name is important that is Kanagana Halli and this site forms the part of a larger site known as Sannati. Now Sannati is a very famous site as far as the Buddhism is concerned and more importantly the Mauryan Empire is concerned. At this particular site there has been located a Mahastupa which is named as Adholoka Mahachetya. And the uniqueness of this particular site is that there has been found a stone portrait which is considered to be the only surviving image of the Mauryan Empire which has had the inscription Raya Asoko in the Brahmi script. This fact is very important. This is the only site having the stone portrait having the inscriptions mentioning Raya Asoko. Asoko is for the King Ashoka and this is written in the Brahmi language. Now coming to the Sanati site, this site is very important and in this very line you should look at this map clearly. This map shows the various edicts of the Ashoka during the Mauryan kingdom. It has the major rock edicts, pillar edicts as well as the minor rock edicts. Here we have Sanati which is a major rock edict. But here you should be aware and you should learn all the important edicts of Ashoka. Starting from the north we have Manesar, Shabasgadi, Kandhar, Kalsi, Delhi Topara, Merat, Lumbini, Lauria Nandangar, Rampurva, Lauria Araraj, Kaushambi, Girnar, Sopara, Sanati we have discussed. Amravati, Jogada, Dholi, very important, and Yeraguti. So these are some of the important edicts of Ashoka and they are very important from the prelims perspective because there can be questions asking directly the locations of these particular sites. So now is the time for the question of the day. The question from yesterday's DNS is in front of you. The question asks that which institution is empowered under the Indian laws to decide the allotment of the party symbol in situations where factions or splinter groups form a separate group from the original political party? The correct answer for this question is option B that is the election commission. The question from today's DNS is in relation to the Ashokan edicts. There are two statements given. Statement 1 says discovery of the Ashokan edicts in Sanati in Maharashtra opened new avenues of historical research on Mauryan Emperor Ashoka and Buddhism in its early years. The statement too says, the archaeological survey of India has come up with a plan for the conservation of the site on the banks of Krishna river near Kanagana Halli in Karnataka. You have to find the correct statements out of the given two statements. Option A, one only, B, two only, C, both one and two or D, neither one nor two. So that's all for today. All the very best. Study hard.